we're going to talk about a very important topic that I think is very relevant for every one of us women and even for men too. We are going to talk about anger, and anger not just in the forms of being aggressive, being mean, being reactive, or even being a quote unquote bitch. But anger also in the forms of feeling disappointed, resentful, feeling hurt, being silent about what's important to us, being silent about our needs, and worst of all, feeling depressed. Because as we know, anger, when internalized, can turn into depression or anxiety and addictions as well. I'm very pleased to introduce to you Dr. Harriet Lerner, who is an author, psychologist, and a speaker. Dr. Lerner. Is one of the world's most respected voices in the psychology of women, especially in the areas of anger and family relationships. She is the author of New York Times bestseller *The Dance of Anger*. She has written eleven books, published in thirty-five languages. She has also made numerous media appearances, including NPR, Oprah, and CNN. Go to her website. HarrietLearner.com. Personally, I am very excited to speak to Dr. Lerner today because over the years I've read quite a number of her books and have found the concepts in her books to be very helpful in important relationships in my life. I have often recommended her books to many of my clients. And in 2008, as a graduate student in the counseling psychology program. I attended a very large conference called the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference, and that happens every five years. And it was a really big conference. There were about six thousand people or so, and they got together all the founders of important psychological theories. And so I attended one of Dr. Lerner's workshops, and she talked about women and shame, and how shame has a very large impact on our lives. And so now, as a psychotherapist, I am very pleased to interview Dr. Lerner about anger. Here is Dr. Harriet Lerner. So thank you very much, Dr. Lerner, for、um, agreeing to come onto my show today and to share with me your expertise and insight. And I'm really happy to have you on the show today. Well, I'm happy to be here. So I'm just wondering what led you to write about anger. Well, I wrote the Dance of Anger because I noticed、um, that for so many people, and especially women, that difficulty with anger was at the heart of so many problems of anxiety and depression, and problems in marriage and relationships. And it's such an important emotion. And there was absolutely nothing written on the subject of women's anger when I started out. So it was a very neglected topic.、Mm -hmm. And your book, The Dance of Anger, was written in 1985, I believe. Is that right? Well, it's funny. Yeah, it was written a quarter of a century ago. Yeah, and it took five years, five years to get it published because no one wanted to publish a book on women's anger. They said that no one would would read it because no one wanted to be one of those angry women. Yes. And in fact, you know, this is the book that is still flying off the shelves. So、um, I'm glad I persisted over those five years of the book being rejected. How many copies have been sold now?、Um, over three million in this country, with 25 foreign translations.、Yeah. So this is a it's very, incredible. Very, so I'm really glad you persisted. <laughs> yes, me too. Yeah. Can you tell us? Well, how how do women tend to respond to anger? Well, when I wrote the Dance of Anger, anger was very taboo for women, and this is still true. You know, women are we're the nurturers and the soothers and the steadiers of rocked boats, and women can get angry on behalf of other people, like children,、um, but to get angry on behalf of our own. You know, to take up a woman's cause, for example, to be a feminist, that there are still very negative stereotypes against angry women that actually serve to silence women, because no one wants to be called one of those pejorative labels,、yes. you know,、mm -hmm. witches and bitches and shrews and castrating and ball breaking and etc. So anger is a taboo emotion for women. And the reason that the book that it's so important 
is that anger is actually an essential emotion for all of us. And it serves two very important purposes. One is that anger helps us to define the self, you know, to define who we are, to say, this is what I am, this is what I believe, this is the ground I stand on, these are the things I will and will not do. So anger can help us with that. And also anger is a vehicle for change, whether we're talking about personal change or social and political change, anger can signal the necessity for change. Anger can let us know whether it's, you know, in a family relationship or a friendship, it it can let us know that business can continue its usual. So this is a, a really important emotion. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. people don't use anger in these positive ways. They don't use it to define the self and as a vehicle for change. Instead, people do things with their anger that do not work. Mm-hmm. So those are the benefits of of anger in this sense, right? Mm-hmm. That it can uh, it can be an opportunity for change, and it also can let us know what needs that we have that are not being fulfilled. Exactly, in the same way that pain tells us to take our hand off the hot stove, the pain of our anger can preserve the very dignity and integrity of the self. And again, the problem is that um, people do not use anger effectively. Mm -hmm. So actually, when I started off writing The Dance of Anger, my original title, which my publisher vetoed, was called Nice Ladies and Bitches, A Woman's Guide to Anger. And those terms, and I put bitches in quotes, um, reflect the two ways that we mismanage anger. So if you're in the nice lady category, you give in, you go along, you don't rock the boat, um, you know, you avoid anger and conflict at all costs. And beyond avoiding anger, if you're in the nice lady category, you may avoid any clear statement of self, Mm -hmm. you know, saying this is what I believe and let me tell you how I see it differently if you think it's going to rock the boat in a relationship. So in the nice lady category, there's a tremendous loss of self. And then in the other category, the quote bitch category, people get angry. We get angry with ease, but getting angry is getting nowhere or even making things worse. So the woman ends up in endless cycles of fighting and complaining and blaming that go no that go nowhere. So I wrote the dance of anger um, to help women and actually men too, men read it too now, to get unstuck Mm -hmm. from yo yoing back and forth between distance and blame and silence. Myself being an, an Asian person, you know, in sort of more traditional cultures, oh. there's so many negative implications. Like you said, because people think of the opposite of the nice lady is is the bitch, right? The quote unquote uh-huh. bitch. And That's so people right. are so scared right. of, of being labeled as such. It's it's so important. And I think the the cultural piece is very, very important. I'm glad you bring it in. And of course some of us come from families And cultures where anger, especially for women, is very taboo. And I think that's still true. You know, it's interesting to me, for Mm -hmm. example, how many women don't want to identify as being a feminist. They don't want to use the the F word because there is this stereotype, you know, of this angry woman who doesn't like men. And again, those taboos and those stereotypes serve to silence women because society um, is much more comfortable with a woman who's guilty, you know, who is guilty and self-doubting and is saying, what's wrong with me? That is much more comfortable than angry women who, you know, were joining together collectively to fight for our own legitimate rights. And of course, if you're silent and you're not able to say what you really think and believe mm-hmm. and it, you'll offer you'll also suffer a great deal so that women can become quite depressed or anxious or just plain unhappy when 
they're preserving a relationship at the expense of their own self. Mm-hmm. Um, and also fighting and blaming, as we all know firsthand, that doesn't work either. You know, if you're just going round and round like a broken record, um, it doesn't work either. And we all yo-yo back and forth between yeah. fighting and distance because we're all hardwired for a fight flight response so it just takes a little bit of stress and people will either distance and cut off um like in my in my dad's family where there was a you know very painful immigration that stress was handled by people just cutting off from each other and Mm -hmm. keeping people at arm's length well more than at arm's length in my dad's family you know if someone got mad at you they might never speak to you again or or forgive you and you know there were people in this family if they passed in the street they pretended not to recognize each other Mm -hmm. and that's a flight response or you see a fight response you know that Mm -hmm. it just takes a little bit of stress and people get very polarized (laughs) we sure are seeing this today in the political realm I mean people will get very polarized they will get over focused on what the other person's doing wrong and under focused on their own creative options to move differently. And nothing's going to change in an angry situation if you're just focused on the other person because we can't change the other person. You know, all we can do is to get very creative about how we're going to move differently and speak differently in that relationship. Can you just sort of paint a picture so that the, the, the the woman and even the man can imagine what is it like when someone who is not a nice lady or nice person, and yet she is, Mm -hmm. or he is also not an, uh, an aggressive complainer, ineffective. What was that person is like? Well, one of the first things, Um, I'm going to sort of shift your question into sort of how to, you know, and one of the first things is that we need to calm down. Um, You know, I grew up with this theory that if you're angry, you're supposed to let it out right away Uh and vent it. And really that that's not useful. So if you were looking at a very mature person, you would look at a person who took the time Um, to be very thoughtful about what the problem is and what they want to accomplish and what their own part, you know, in an escalating pattern is. And no one can think clearly in the midst of a tornado. So getting your own intensity down and lowering your intensity is um, very, very useful. In other words, don't don't send that angry Mm. email, you know, that's too on yeah. your sister like just wait and uh, by the way never you know try to do an angry communication on email email is not the way to do that it will i promise you and yet it's so tempting isn't that it? because because you can say what you want and you don't get that confrontation you don't get that immediate so it's, it's often very tempting for people and yet like you said it's so damaging well it's very tempting to send an angry or confrontive email I can just tell you the person on the other end is not going to read it or it's just going to make them mad. And the other mistake that people make, especially when they're angry, whether they're using email or they're confronting someone, is they they over talk it. And it would be impossible for me to Mm -hmm. emphasize um, how important brevity is, how profoundly important it is to say it shorter. You know, people think the more they add to their yeah, yeah. case, the better the other mm-hmm. is going to listen. It it uh, actually works the yeah. other way around. And it's really interesting because um, when I was writing my book, The Mother Dance, and I interviewed a lot of kids, and I would say, what can your mother do? You know, also your father, but I'll say, what can your mother do to make things better in the family? <laughs> and the number one answer was say it shorter, I can just smile because I like, can just see what you're going to say <laughs> talk less 
Right. In other words, and say it calmly. You know, you don't have to yell. Like, say it shorter. Like, like just say, I want you to clean yeah. your room. You have to clean your room. You know, you go on. The, the kid will say, you go on and on. And, you know, by the time you're done, I don't even remember the yeah. first thing that you said. And brevity is very difficult for people. It's very, very difficult. Um, you know, especially if you're bright and articulate and you like words, like I'm sure so many of our listeners. So it's very hard for people in a sentence or two to say, you know, when they're angry, to say something just in a sentence or, um, you know, to be able to say, that hurt my yeah. feelings. And then just leave the space. It's very hard. Or, you know, I've told you it's important for me that you call if you're going to be late to dinner. You know, this is the third time this week that you've come late and haven't called, you know, I want you to know this is important to me. One of the things that we stared up is for people to say, you're making a big deal about it, or it's about you, it's about your feeling. Exactly. And you know what I would say then? I would say, well, you know, it may be a big deal, and I may be oversensitive, Mm -hmm. and it is about me, and it is, these are my feelings. You know, even if they seem crazy or oversensitive to you, they they are my feelings. And, you know, and the conversation might continue. And you might say, help me to understand, given you know that this hurts me and it's hard for me, help me to understand why you keep doing Mm -hmm. it. And again, it's very hard to, I mean, this is a problem I have. It's very hard to, as I said, say it very, with great brevity and then then leave a space. Well, sometimes just even repeat the, the request or the, the, the feeling even. Yeah, and, and then very often you have to take the conversation to the next level. I yeah. mean, if it's something important and you've said it very well mm-hmm. and the person's not responding, um, one, this is going to sound like a silly little technique, but it's not. You know, mm-hmm. one way to exceed that person's threshold of deafness is to have the conversation again at a calm time, but in a different setting. Yeah. Not in the room where you've had a lot of fighting, whether that's the living room or the bedroom or the kitchen, or you go, you know, to a restaurant or a coffee shop or a place where you have not been to have the conversation again. And sometimes you need to take the conversation to another level. I mean, you need to say, you know, we we had this talk and this hasn't changed. And I, you know, want you to know that this is difficult and painful for me and, you know, sort of help me to understand why you keep saying this or doing this Mm -hmm. or not, or not doing this. And, um, if, you know, we haven't talked about having a bottom line. Yes. Yeah, that's so important too, isn't it? It's so important, right? So sometimes, you know, you need to say, if this continues, let's say if this, you know, your drinking continues and you're not getting help and staying with it, I want you to know that I just cannot sit around like a bump on the log and watch you crash and burn. It's too difficult for me. Mm -hmm. So I need you to know that if, you know, if this doesn't change or you don't do X and Y, that I do not know how long I can stay in the relationship. It's not that I want to leave the relationship. It would be devastating to me. But it's, it's, you know, I don't know how long I can continue. And on a scale of divorce from, you know, one to ten scale, if ten were... Um, calling a lawyer, I want you to know that I'm at about a seven. And if this behavior continues, you know, I'm going to be up to a 10. Now, that's a very extreme example. I mean, that's an example where something is really a deal breaker. But people have bottom lines in the dailiness of a relationship. And actually, I can give you a good example. I think I give this one in my book, Marriage Rules, where... You know, it was my week to do the dishes, and I wasn't, I don't like to do pots and pans, and I kept leaving them, and my husband would, (laughs) you know, say, it's your turn, it's your turn, and I was too busy, and I never got to it. 
So then Friday rolled around and I wanted to go out to the movies with him. And what he said to me, and he said it very calmly and very nicely, because you don't have to say it angrily to have a bottom line. He, he said, I'm going down to the basement to play music and no movies <laughs> and no business as usual until, you know, you do the pots and pans. It, it's, so he gave and, you a bottom line. <laughs> It was it was the bottom line, yeah. and it's not like if you don't do the pots and pans, I'm you know I'm going to yeah. divorce you. It, mm-hmm. but it was the bottom line because he meant it. Yeah. When you really have a bottom line, it means you're really in your body, and when you say you know this won't fly, you know no business as usual, that you really mean it. So, for example, for our listeners. If you have a bottom line, and this is a good one, if you have a bottom line where you're saying, you know, I want to hear anything important that you have to tell me, but you need to approach me with respect. Yes. And not like I'm a big, you know, jerk or idiot. When you can approach me with respect, come back and talk to me. But I will not be in the conversation when you're treating me rudely. Now, what matters if you say that is that you leave, you leave the conversation when you're treated rudely. You don't, you know, lecture, you don't cry, you don't look sad, you know, you, you leave. So, so what the bottom line is, the bottom line is that place where our beliefs and values and priorities are not negotiable. And you can say it very sweetly, but you have to have a bottom line or your relationship will go downhill. When you have a bottom line and, and, and you're really serious about it, people around you, they pick up and they don't even argue with you. Or maybe if you're not used to having the bottom line, I think at first they will try to argue, but I think if they really pick up how, how firm you are and it doesn't uh-huh. have to be so mean uh-huh. and aggressive, right? Like I think people, people and children respond to that really well too, I think. And, uh, you know, I think that's true of horses and, uh, and our dogs and all that. Yeah. They, they also know. They know when you really mean it, when you're, like, in your body and yeah. and you mean it. Now, I want to add, it's a really important point you're making, that people will test you out. Yeah. When you take a new position or you take a bottom line where, you know, you say to your kid, if this happens, then, you know, this is the consequence, or you say, to your partner or friend, I will not be in the conversation mm-hmm. if you're going to be rude. They will test you out. That's normal. So you need to stand behind that bottom line. And that's it's very difficult. You know, that is really difficult. So I talked a lot about the bottom line mm-hmm. and the dance, the dance of anger, um, because it's so hard, especially in marriage yeah. and with children. I think it's a Hard. Yeah, I really uh, appreciate your book, how you talked a lot about uh, counter moves, you know, how when we first make the, the, the changes, it's actually quite uncomfortable. And, and for some time, it seems like you're rocking the boat. And yet it's almost like waves. Eventually, the waves will level out. I think a lot of, um, you know, some of the clients I see, it's, it's that uncomfortable moment that's really hard for them to to bear. It is profoundly uncomfortable and you know let's tell our listeners it's not just a moment you know? <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> keep yeah. rolling in so if you're taking an important position like you're saying let's say you've done everything for your um you know mother who has a lot of needs and you realize that you just can't do so much because it's too much at your own expense and you say to her you know you open a conversation where you Say, you know, I, I love you. I wish I could do all for you that I watch you do for your own mother. But, you know, I'm just not able to. And, you know, let me tell you the things that I can and, you know, that I really can't do. Well, what do you think your mother's going to say? Is she going to say, oh, I'm so pleased that you're being so assertive and no. <laughs> finding yourself so clearly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Relationships don't work that way. So what the other person will say is, you know, that's really selfish for you, and I did everything for Grandma, and you just think about yourself, and I don't want you to hire anyone. I don't want anyone else taking care of me. That That's normal. Mm-hmm. 
so that one has to become and understand this is a long-term process and say, you know, I'm really sorry, Mom. You know, I, I, I wish that yeah. I could do for you what you did for your own mother, but, but I can't, you know, and um, I just can't because I'll be so tired and like that I'll be crawling in that bed with you and where you can hang in. And if you're very creative, you staying with the same example, you might also ask questions to your mom, like, what was it like for you, mom, that, that you had so much responsibility for your mother and did she live with us? Like, what, you know, tell me more about what that was like for you. But we get pulled into the old fights, we get pulled into over-talking, mm-hmm. and um, going back to what, you're, what you said, you're right, people will, over time, they will recognize a real bottom line position because you mean it if you're ready to mean it. Once you're able to set the boundaries, actually you're able to, in some ways, you're able to truly be there for other people uh, without sacrificing your own needs. Right, right. And of course, I think especially for women, it's so difficult. You know, when you said sacrificing your own needs, it's so difficult for all of us to know where our responsibility yeah. to other people ends and our responsibility to our own self and ensuring the quality and direction of our own life. Where does that begin? So very often women I work with will be very angry if a demand's made on them, but they're not yet clear their self about what they're entitled mm. to. Um and that's going to vary. It's going to vary by culture. It's yeah. going to vary by, for example, if you're a firstborn daughter, mm-hmm. you might have a much stronger sense of responsibility for caretaking for an elderly parent than a youngest child or a brother. And it's so difficult to um, really clarify your own values. It's easier to just get mad at other people because they're demanding so much. You know, one of the concepts you talked about is sort of defining the core issue. Like I have a, a client who would say to me, you know, my my partner called me a, a slut in front of my children. And I, I it's, it's really upset because I don't want my children to, uh, to hear those things. And I had to explain to her, he should not call you a slut or any de- derogatory terms, period, whether in front of your right. children or not. Exactly, because the question that you would be asking her, which is really what you're saying, is, well, if you didn't have children, would that be fine with you? Mm-hmm. That he calls what? And that's a very common example of where the woman might say, you know, it's so upsetting to my kids that yeah. my husband comes home from work at 8 o'clock. It's like they don't have a father. And it's more difficult for women to say, I need him home Mm -hmm. earlier. One of the examples you use in your book is the woman who called you and said, I couldn't attend the workshop because my husband thinks that the workshop is uh, not good or that, you know, it's it's feminist. And Ryan, you talked about how that's not the problem. The problem is more whether she's able to make a decision on her own to attend a workshop or not. Right, right. And very often we fight about pseudo issues. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I mentioned in the dance of anger, the very first couple that I ever saw, saw yeah. in marital therapy and they were a very intelligent professional couple and they were having this impassioned argument about whether they should eat at McDonald's or Long John Silver's. Yeah, they yeah. Were <laughs> fighting and fighting and I was a new therapist and I actually I didn't have a clue how mm-hmm. to be helpful to them. But at least I was intelligent enough to know that this impassioned fight had nothing to do with the relative merits of hamburgers versus fish. And, you know, we do fight about pseudo issues. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you another really, um, this is a more complex example of the same point you're making of not knowing the real issue. We don't even know with whom the real issue is. Mm -hmm. And the common example is what what I call a mother-in-law triangle, where the wife hates her mother-in-law, and there's all this negative intensity between the wife and the mother-in-law. Now, when you find a wife and a mother-in-law slugging it out, you also find a husband 
who is very passive and cannot find his voice to take a position with his own mother. Mm -hmm. So the woman might say, you know, my mother-in-law is so difficult and, you know, she calls my husband and she, you know, demands he goes over there, et cetera, et cetera. And, And really the problem is she's mad at her husband because he is unable to say no to his own mother. Yeah. Or he is not saying, for example, you know, Mom, I love you and I love my wife and, you know, I want you both to be kind to each other. And when you criticize my wife, um, you know, I bring those criticisms to me, Mom. Mm-hmm. I'm not made of tissue paper. Mm-hmm. You know, it's so it's a very interesting uh, thing, the way anger usually gets played out by blaming a woman, yeah. like the stepmother, the mother-in-law. Or the ex-wife. I find that's a, a big one. The yeah. ex-wife, ex-partner. Right. Yeah, that's a big one. Exactly. And it, it's not that these people are innocent. Mm-hmm. It's, that, it, it's, it's not the primary issue. And the most beautiful example of that confusion is the story of Hansel and Gretel. Because in the story of Hansel and Gretel, you know, the story ends... And we all hate the wicked stepmother who sent the children out to die. And she was such a meanie. What could the poor father do, Mm -hmm. you know, but go along and send his own children out to die? So it's like the father is innocent Mm -hmm. and the the stepmother, who might have had five minutes of history with these kids, is the guilty one. And people read that story and they don't realize if someone is responsible here, someone is yeah. really needs to apologize to these kids, it is the dad who did not stand up to his wife, you know, but rather sent his kids out to die. So I think sometimes it's very difficult to hold men accountable. It's sometimes easier to blame, you know, to blame to the woman, woman because we we justify the man's lack of emotional skills or lack of social skills or whatever we we are more okay with that i think for some reason well we do learn we do learn to expect much less from men in the private sphere in the private sphere meaning whether it's going to you know be to take care of kids or notice when the you know clothing is molding in the dryer i mean we we learn to expect less from from men and um, you know and it goes without saying that any generalizations we make about men and women there are many 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 exceptions you know where the men are stepping up to the plate in the home and the women are under functioning but as a rule in most cultures we expect a great deal from men in terms of earning and breadwinning and in the public sphere and much less, you know, in everything from women in the project fear. And thankfully, that's changing somewhat. One of the concepts that you, you talked about that I also found useful is the concept of, of underfunctioning, over, overfunctioning. Can you explain to our listeners kind of in more, in, a, in ways that they can understand? Underfunctioning, underfunctioning and overfunctioning is actually a very complicated concept and to I'm trying to think of a way to say it simply that if you are doing too much for someone you know you're bailing them out you know either financially or emotionally and you're doing things you're you're doing and giving too much that person will underfunction in the sense they will be less able to reach for their competence to solve their own problem. And the more people overfunction, the more the other will underfunction. And of course, the more the other underfunctions, the more the other will overfunction. I think a simpler one for people to understand is the distancer and the pursuer. You know, that if you pursue a very private person who needs more space, they're going to distance more. And then the more the distancer distances, the more the pursuer gets anxious and pursues more. And um, it's important to change one's own part in the dance yeah it's so easy to get sucked into that dance isn't it because it's kind of like you bang onto the door hoping for the other person to open but the more you bang onto that door the more Mm -hmm. that person Uh will just too scared to open the doors almost like you have to step back in order for them to to open that door or to have some space to want to open that door 
Right, exactly. And what's very interesting about humans is that when we're doing something, like banging on the door, lecturing to our child, giving someone the cold treatment, or it, whatever it is we're doing, if it's not working, do we stop and do something different? Uh, no. We you know, humans do keep doing it. Doing, <laughs> we keep doing more of the same. So if it's not useful to lecture and punish, we, you know, lecture and, and lecture and shame and punish even more. And it's very um, hard to get off automatic pilot and really get creative to take a new position and a new stance in the relationship. And a lot of the book, The Dance of Anger, is teaching people how to not do the same old steps and to do something different. Yeah, and it's kind of related to uh, an earlier point that you made earlier. You know, whenever we change the steps in the dance in the beginning, it's, it's awkward, it's unnatural. And people will say, well, that's not me. But yet, that's sort of the necessary part of making the change. Right. It's, it's very difficult to do something different. And it does feel like you're doing something that's not yourself, but you're trying on a new you. So if, for example, your pattern is every time you go home for Thanksgiving, you get into a fight with your mother about religion because, you you know, you think she's some kind of religious nut, and maybe she is that it takes a lot of courage to decide that you'll go home the next Thanksgiving and rather than fight about religion, that you will not fight. And instead, you might get very curious about your most religious beliefs and how she came upon them and whether her beliefs are the same as her parents' beliefs and, you know, how religion has been helpful to her. You know, to do something very surprising and very mature and very different. You go home for Thanksgiving and no one ever talks to Uncle Charlie because he's the black sheep in the family and, you know, people just talk about him but never to him. And you may decide that you're going to connect with him. You know, I don't mean in an extreme way, but in a person-to-person way. And yet, you know, this is the big adventure in life to be able to try out a new view. And at first it might feel phony or might make you feel anxious, um, and it requires courage. Everything new worth doing requires courage. So the paradox is when you sort of allow yourself to be open to their views, that's when they're more likely to listen to you. Like I find with my mom, you know, because I, I use what you, some of your recommendations, and my mom, she's sort of more judgmental. And so sometimes talking to her, I, in the past, I would have a, a need to to argue back and often I would right like sort of to tell mm-hmm. that's not right and so now I find I just sort of listen and accept it okay that's her point of view that's how she sees it and so now you know our conversations are much more authentic I don't feel like I'm not myself because it's a conscious choice right I don't feel like I lose myself in that conversation I would add something to it because at some point that's a wonderful example At some point, since you've done something so difficult, which is to be able to just lower your own reactivity and see it as having to do with your mother, not having to do with you, but having to do with your mother, you know, at some point, if she's being very, if she's being judgmental, et cetera, you might say something like, "Uh, Mom, are you proud of me? Mm -hmm. And really leaving the space. Yeah. You know, and you might say, she might say, well, of course I'm proud of you. And, and you know, you might say, well, sometimes I, I feel a little judged as if, you know, maybe I'm not living up to your standards. So one can also, um, again, if one can do it with great brevity, if one can do it lightly, um, one can say, because I remember, you know, your story reminds me of a story with my dad where he was always talking about what a genius, <laughs> you know, my sister is, right, yeah. I was like a turtle, you know, sort of plodding along, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, and I remember once asking him, you know, I just said, you know, Dad, are, are you proud of me or have I disappointed you? He said, oh, no, you know, I'm proud of you. And um, I said, you know, well, I sometimes get the feeling that even if I won the Nobel Prize, mm-hmm. in your eyes, Susan would always be the brilliant one. And he said, Well, that's true. 
which is very <laughs> interesting. Yeah. <laughs> he said, that's true. And I said, because I, I was feeling very calm, I said, well, how do you understand that? I was very curious because at this point my sister had lost her job and I was on the New York Times bestseller list. And yeah, yeah. He would just kept going on and on about what it, how brilliant she was. And so I said, well, how do you understand that? That um, even if I won a Nobel Prize, that you would, uh, you know, not revise <laughs> how you see that. And he said, well, if you won a Nobel Prize, it would be because you were brilliant in one thing. But Susan, mm. she's brilliant everything. Oh, that sort of hurts. Very, well, you know, it actually mm. didn't hurt because huh. it was so crazy. Yeah. You know, it, it was so extreme that I realized at that point, you know, that logic, logic was not going to help with the conversation. And I just became more curious about like in his own sibling group mm. when he was growing up. Was there a child who was seen as very special and very brilliant? But if, when we can lower our reactivity and get curious and experimental, then we've really grown up. Yes. And you can't do it all the time, but you can do it more of the time. And, and it's really hard with loved ones. Isn't mm-hmm. it? It's really hard to lower that, that um, reactivity. And yet when, when we can do it, it transforms so many other relationships, I find. Yes, it does. And, you know, we're wired for reactivity. So the brain is, uh, John Tabat Zinn, who has done a lot of work in meditation, he likens our brain to the surface of the ocean. And it's always going to be whipped around by weather. Yeah. But there's a deeper calm underneath that we can aim for. But, you know, we're human, so we're going to get reactive, we're going to get anxious, we're going to get angry. Our brain is going to wake us up three in the morning, you know, enraged at what our ex is doing, you know, anxious about all kinds of catastrophes. And that's how we're wired. But that's not the time to send the angry email, you know, to your your sister. Um, We have to have ways to calm ourselves down and be able to think. And not just react. Yeah. So before we end here today, mm-hmm. what would be your take-home message for our listeners? So I would say the biggest challenges are lower your reactivity. And well, it's funny that I'm going to choose this one, but say it shorter. Yeah. Very often the culprit is the sheer number of sentences and the intensity in our voice. So if you can slow down your speech and turn down the volume and making a criticism in three sentences or less, uh, it can really change a lot. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Lerner. It's really been an insightful conversation that I have with you today. for For me too. For me too. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. And that was Dr. Harriet Lerner author of New York Times bestseller, The Dance of Anger. Go to her website, harrietlearner.com.